Okay, guys, welcome back. I hope y'all enjoyed the little video there. It's about cervical spinal anatomy. It was a YouTube video that we went ahead, we got on there for you guys to look at it, kind of go over the structural anatomy of the spinal column from top to bottom. So that way you can kind of look at it. And so we'll get started back with what we've got here. Okay, so right here, the pathophysiology behind the spinal cord injury. Remember this right here, the primary injury is going to be what then? The moment of the initial impact as it is with everything. What injury occurred at this moment in time? And we have to be good investigators to try to figure this out. So we have secondary injuries, such as after the initial impact itself. So our primary injury is what we have to focus on directly on the injury. Secondary, of course, is that now, what potentially can worsen the patient's outcome related to a secondary injury? Is what we, and what we're doing for this patient in our care for this patient, are we going to be doing what we need to to help prevent any further injury from the patient or any secondary injury that may have occurred related to the actual primary incident itself? Such as the patient hit, the, like this patient here, he hit his head on the bottom of the pool, okay, so he suffered a spinal cord injury. But also on top of that, now what we're looking at is, is that he has an abrasion on the head. Does it begin to swell? Does he begin to have unequal pupils? Does he begin to have abnormal responses? Is, his alter, is he becoming altered level of consciousness? Does he have increase of numbness and sensation, you know, increase of numbness and tingling in his legs or where he can't feel anything at all? Do I have any broken bones that are associated with it? Do I start to notice a head injury? We have raccoon eyes, a basal or skull fracture because the patient hit his head on the front, on the, on the actual bottom of the pool. Does he have some sort of a coup, contra coup injury related like you would if you were struck in the back of the head or involved in an auto accident? You got to start thinking about all those secondary injuries and what may occur, such as right, and with this right here we're looking at, such as our care that's been for this patient right here, and what may result in the end of this actual spinal cord injury itself. So we're looking at it. We have some what are specifically called intrinsic causes of the secondary injuries that we just kind of briefly went over. So let's go to a little bit more further in detail. Okay, let's talk about edema. Again, we know what edema is. It could be edema to the head, but also it could be swelling of the spinal cord itself that's compressing on the nerve fibers, correct? Resulting in a nerve damage and neurological deficit of the patient, which we know neurological deficit is mean we're looking at for pulse motor sensory sensation. Can you squeeze my hands? Do you feel me touching you know, your foot? Which, which, foot am I you know, which foot am I touching? Which toe am I touching? Which finger am I touching? Do we have a positive or negative Babinski sign on this patient? Hematomas, right? Bleeding specifically related to the actual secondary injury. Bleeding within the spinal cord that is compressing on the spinal cord we have to think about. Resulting again in nerve damage and neurological deficit. Will we know this in the field? Probably not. But however, if we do see external injuries, we often know that there may be more further detailed and more more descriptive or even more critical type of internal injuries, such as increased ICP. We covered in the last lecture. We have to think about, okay, we have cerebral spinal fluid in the spinal cord canal, correct? Do we have an increase in cranial pressure, going to cause the patient to suffer a TBI, whatever else it may be? Do we have something related to this? And then, of course, then we have the ultimate end result of a patient who suffers a a head injury or hits the bottom of the pool with a, tra with a traumatic injury, with a spinal cord injury, is often, do we have any seizures that are associated with this, such as full tonic-clonic type seizures related to it, not like a petit mal seizure, a Jacksonian seizure, a focal seizure. It's more so a full clonic tonic grand mal seizure. So when you're thinking about this right here, what, you know, and you're thinking about the things that can increase intracranial pressure, things that can happen, of course, is looking at what we have to deal with. And you say, okay, do I notice that the patient is getting worse and worse and worse, or are they staying relatively the same? If you notice things getting worse, like we talked in the last lecture specifically about head injuries, and they're alert, they're, now they're having an altered level of consciousness, their pupils begin to have unequal pupils. From there, they start to have posturing associated with it, with abnormal breathing patterns. Now we're getting down to the factors, now they have abnormal abnormal deserbent posturing with abnormal breathing patterns as well. Does the patient start off having no, no, not any numbness or tingling? Is the alert and oriented times three not confused, but now remains confused, and now because after we have moved the patient, we now start to have ourselves an increase of 
the patient having the ability not to be able to squeeze my hands. The patient has a loss of sensation, a loss of feeling, but we move the patient. Is that related to something that we did or something that's just a natural progression? That again comes to the factors of you providing specific care for that patient and being very, very, very aware of his injury or her injury and then being able to have that restrictive spinal motion restriction of that and being able to get that patient on the backboard and properly pad everywhere that needs to be done, feeling exactly if there's any point tenderness where it's at, padding those voided areas where you need to, is very, very important with this patient. So now then, systematic causes that we're dealing with. Okay, you think about systematic causes, okay, that may be related to the secondary injury. What, first of all, is anemia? Okay, think about what is anemia. For some of y'all, think about what is anemia. Anemia, like it says up here on the slide, is a hemorrhage. But remember this right here. It's a lack of blood flow that can cause an ischemic injury to occur. So when you have a lack of blood flow and you have this hemorrhage that's related to it, it can actually cause a restriction of blood flow, which actually flows through the spinal cord. We also have another one here. We're dealing specifically with what? Hypotension. So when we're dealing with hypotension, we know what it can do. It can result in what? Shock. Now when we're dealing with shock, what happens with hypotension? Do we get what kind, do we get a do we get an acid buildup of some kind? What type of acid do you think we get built up? For those of y'all who may be thinking you may already have, you may have already popped it out of your brain just sitting there listening to the lecture. But it's going to be a what you're going to have is actually a release of lactic acid into the bloodstream. Okay. Therefore, when the release of lactic acid into the bloodstream, the patient should start breathing a little bit faster because you're building up lactic acid, which can then aggravate the injury even more. Because when you get the lack of oxygen, therefore you now have what? You don't have good oxygen transport that's going to the cells, and therefore it can actually further increase the injury itself and aggravate your injury. We now have hypocarbia versus hypercarbia, meaning low carbon dioxide versus a high carbon dioxide level. Okay, like you'd normally see like a COPD patient that's hypercarbic all the time. Remember these, remember the one thing about this right here with hypocarbia and hypercarbia is remember that your levels of carbon dioxide, those can cause a vasoconstriction and high levels of CO2 can, levels can actually cause vasodilation. So when you're dealing with injuries, right, you want to make sure that you don't that the CO2 level is not too high, which is over 30. Remember we talked about it's going to be like 30 to 35. You start getting up 45 to 50, correct? You now have an increase of CO2. It's going to start causing problems to occur within the human body, especially if they have the brain injury that's associated with it as well. Let's think about this right here: hypo hyperglycemia. What if this was related to the injury itself? Or this a result of the, or this could be a result secondarily to the injuries itself and the systematic causes. We have to think about that because remember with hypoglycemia and, and going back to that that y'all covered in your initial education, whatever else it may be through Con Ed or whatever else it may be, can result in a reduction of ATP. Now remember if we don't have enough ATP in the system, what happens? A lack of oxygen that's in the cells itself. We don't we're not producing enough ATP, therefore we don't get proper cellular metabolism. Without proper cellular metabolism, what do you have? You have hypercarbic, the patient can build that up. You can have a you can have a retention of CO2, not enough oxygen to the cells, not enough oxygen to the body, and therefore you patients developing the patients in the state of hypoxemia. Also, now what we're dealing with is with hyperglycemia, correct? If there's the secondary injuries that are related to it, correct, that are affected because maybe the injury caused this to occur in the secondary injury, that it can affect the healing processes, which also helps which also can actually prohibit the factors of the spinal cord itself healing as well because the body doesn't have a tendency to heal very well in the present state of a hyperglycemic condition. And again, we're talking about hy hypoxia and hyperoxia. We covered that in the last lecture, but we'll do it a little bit more here as well. Is that with hypoxia, remember, it's a result of shock. So would you say to yourself, is this patient hypoxic? Are they in a hypoxic state without getting any more else, any further dissemination from the actual, from their vital signs or anything else? Are they hypoxic? Because they, they do appear to be having the factors of their low blood pressure. And we're going to see that blood pressure in a few minutes. Anaerobic metabolism that, can, that, can, that occurs. 
Hyperoxygenation can also cause what? Vasoconstriction to occur. So we've got to watch, making sure they're not too hyperoxygenated. And it can form what? Too much oxygen can form what's free radicals in the body. When those cells do not have anything to attach to, they become free radicals in the body that can actually create more problems for your patient. So you have to think about that if you're going to be too oxygenated for the patient. Patients can actually die from hyperoxemia secondary to actual too much oxygen, whether it be on the scene, excessive ventilation of the patient, correct? All these things can be what occurs with them. So these are things that you actually need to think about. Okay, so we have the next portion right here that we're going to look at on our lecture fashion. Okay, and now we're going to look at the vital signs of the patient. Okay, let's take a look at our vital signs that we've got. So, look at your blood pressure, correct? We see a blood pressure of 82 over 50. Do y'all think that's good or bad? Okay, you're probably thinking, okay, that's a bad blood pressure. Now, we already saw, and we know that it is, right, because it's, it's below... It's below at least 90, correct? But however, it's a 22-year-old person. They should have a relatively normal blood pressure, correct? He's about 122 over 80 is average, 100 plus their age. So you're going, okay, the blood pressure is low, but yet we try to remember what was it before. Their, their skin color, temperature, condition, whatever it may be, they appear to be warm and dry, pink in color, but yet now we have a blood pressure that confirms what it was that we had before. Correct, but you have weak, you have weak pulses, thready pulses, thready radio pulses, weak carotid pulses. Correct. Then our ventilatory rate. What's the ventilatory rate? Okay, good. You can see that it's 20. So potentiation for a head injury. We're still within stable limits here, right? But notice this one thing. I want to share this with you guys. You may not have seen this yet. Your patient has a ventilatory rate of 20. But he now has what is known as diaphragmatic breathing. So let's recap what diaphragmatic breathing is. Okay? That means is that when he is breathing, what's going on? Is he breathing from here or is it diaphragmatic breathing? Correct? Yes, that is right. Diaphragmatic breathing means what's going on. Okay? That the breathing itself is now in being impeded because now we have ourselves some sort of an injury that's not allowing full expansion back and forth of the chest that is that is a, not a passive formation of breathing the diaphragm has now become an active formation of breathing okay that's really what's most important normally the diaphragm is very passive right when you inhale and exhale but now it's become an active motion of breathing alright we do however have an oxygen saturation of 97% very good so far. Now, again, this is, we've now got the patient on oxygen for this. But notice on here, look at our end tidal CO2. Right here, look what we have, 42. Remember, we have 30 to 35, really good for head injuries, 35 to 40 to 45 is standard. Look, we're getting up a little bit higher on the high end of this carbon dioxide level that it may be. Still not too bad. Glasgow Coma score is going to be right now, again, from what we had before, is about 10. Remember, his iofim response was 4, correct? His verbal response was 5, and his motor function was only 1 because remember, he could not move his arms and his legs, right? So he could not feel them or could not move them at all. Now, here's the key right here. I'm going to give you this right here. His glucose right now is going to be 100, okay? So we got a relatively good, good, good glucose on him. We don't. He's not hypoglycemic, not hyperglycemic. So that far, we're okay. We're stable right now where we're at. Now here's the key right here. Remember we talked about the skin, the skin temperature before. His skin still currently is warm and pink. So you ask yourself, what's going on here? I have a low blood pressure, correct? Pulse rate is what? 54, right? Skin temperature is warm and dry, but again I have a low blood pressure. Why is that? Normally if a patient is going to be in a state of shock, which this blood pressure would indicate for anyone, correct, no matter what age they may be as an adult, not talking about a child, this would indicate to us that this heart rate should be somewhere around 130, 120, 130. O2 sat should be relatively low, you know, maybe in the low 90s. Then we should also, respiratory rate may be actually up a little bit as well. So when we're thinking about it, we have to say, okay, what's going on with this patient? Temperature is 95, correct? 
it's a relatively warm day outside, so they got temperature problems going on right now. Okay? And their pain scale on level one to ten is about a four. So they still do have a pain scale. Now you listen to the you listen to the lung sounds, okay? You're gonna listen bilaterally, correct? You're gonna listen upper and lower lobes. You're gonna notice that you have the breath sounds are clear, equal with good air movement in, in all lung fields, which is okay for right now. But with what you've got going on with this diaphragmatic breathing, and again talking about is that accessory muscle use. They're not using any pectoral muscles again, just to kind of repeat the process. It's all coming from the abdominal area. This should start to clue you in on something. When you see it, you walk up to your patient before you've even touched them, you see that they they that they involved in a spinal in a potential injury that was from a diving accident. They've got an obvious abrasion to the head, so think about what we're talking about now. Obvious abrasion to the head. They appear to be having diaphragmatic breathing, laying supine on the side of the pool in a dry area, and then you walk over to them and you see that they're breathing 20 times a minute. You reach down to feel for the pulse is 54, but it's very weak, but the skin is very warm because they've got him dried off now because he was wet from being pulled out of the pool, and now you're looking at now blood pressure when you start getting vital signs is 82 over 50. You should start to think something else is wrong. You're going to check your pupillary responses. You're going to do a head-to-toe assessment. Always write DCAP BTLS head-to-toe assessment to make that determination. And you're going to say, okay, what's wrong with this patient? Doesn't appear to be a standard patient with just a normal spinal cord injury, correct, that may leave him permanently disabled or not. We do not know that at this time. But we've got to start thinking about it now. So we have to say, okay, he may be in shock, right? Blood pressure is low. He doesn't have any sensation, no movement of the extremities. You may have already know. You may already know what's wrong with him. I don't know because I can't talk to you guys right now. But I'm just trying to, and I can't um, talk to you guys that's in class. But just want you to start thinking about this. And you got his 82 degrees outside. The temperature of the pool. We now know the water, of course, is. We have to consider the the, the actual pool temperature as well. We know he's hypothermic, okay? What do we have to think about from this point on? Okay, so we start to think about it. So we think about what may be wrong with him. Could he have a potential spinal cord injury? Where may this be at? What may be the problem? Is it in the cervical spine? Is it thoracic spine? Is it lumbar spine? Is it, it's got to be somewhere up high because we're both affecting both the arms and the legs as well, but yet he does have pain. Okay, so let's look at the secondary survey now. All right, you have abrasion to the top of the head with minimal bleeding. Okay, you have the neck. Here's the key. You have pain on palpation to C5 and C6 without deformity or crepitus. And again, for your video that we had earlier, that you saw the entire, we did the five to seven minute video and we paused for a little bit, that it talked about all the variable spines, you know, the, the, each one of the cervical spines, the lumbar spine, the thoracic spine, the structure anatomy of it. You can see that C5 and C6, right, that they're without deformity or crepitus, okay? So again, pain on palpation, only pain, but they're without deformity or crepitus. Is that You ask yourself, is that a good sign or a bad sign? I would potentially say when you think about it, that's potentially a good sign. Because if you felt deformity or crepitus, that means that you may have a complete subluxation of the actual spinal cord itself, which means it's completely torn off and the spinal cord itself has been exposed and you now have permanent damage to the spinal cord. Lungs appear to be clear. Again, we have diaphragmatic breathing, right? Now, the abdomen, of course, it appears to be, which is good. We're soft, non tender. We don't have any signs of trauma. We, we palpate all four quadrants. Pelvis appears to be stable, so when he dove to the bottom of the pool, he did not suffer any type of pelvic fracture of any kind. Now, here's what's noted. I want you to see this right here. We often do this, you know, when you're doing your, your head-to-toe assessments, and y'all did it either in your initial education program or maybe in through the, in, or recertifying again, kind of going over it again. But notice right here, we do have a male with priapism noted. That should automatically tell you what you think is going on with this person. Do they truly have a spinal cord injury? The answer to that question is yes. And you may be thinking about what type of spinal cord injury would cause that. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. Okay? So let's think about this right here. On his back, we now have to turn him over, assess the back very carefully, right? And when moving the patient onto the backboard, right, with a splinting device, then the extremities as well. We've now checked the, we've now checked the extremities. 
It says the patient is unable to feel or move his arms or legs, so we're doing pulse motor sensories, checking for capillary refill time, whatever it may be, on, on each one of the extremities, checking for positive Babinski's, correct? That he does not have any type of able to feel in his arms or his legs. So you say, what in the world is going on with this patient? So again, you ask yourself, what's going on with this patient? Right here, when we're looking at it, correct? We're going to ask ourselves, what pathologic process, right, is going on with this patient? What pathologic process? The patient has what? A spinal cord injury, right? Pathologic process now. Not physiological, but pathological. Okay, at the level C5, C6, so we do have tenderness that's there, but we do not have any type of an actual vertebral injury that we can find. Okay, so that's what we got going on right now. Now then we say to ourselves, okay, what immediate interventions need to be performed? The foremost basic intervention that needs to be done right now, of course, is what? Spinal motion restriction, which is going to be maintaining the C-spine. Absolute to prevent any further injury. And I'm talking the details and critical nature of this right here and the factors of that You've got to be so aware of what's going on that the only thing that may be wrong with this person is a spinal cord injury, that everything else may be fine. They may not wind up with a TBI. They may not have any internal injuries that you can find or anything at all. It may only be the spinal cord injury. And what the care that you render right now may make the determination if the patient recovers completely, partially, or suffers permanent disability. This is the point that makes a difference is the initial assessment of this patient and care of this patient on the scene. Not once they get to the hospital, but where you're at right now. If it's based on what we're doing and the care that we're rendering. So we can't be lackadaisical here. We have to make sure that we're very careful with how we take and move this patient, what we do specifically, make sure that we're all in unison with everything that we're doing because we have to be very careful with this patient. Okay, so guys, I want y'all, if y'all can, turn over your books and go to page 300 for me. Okay, in your book, you're going, to find the, you're going to find this thing called the dermatome chart. Very, very interesting, this dermatome chart. It helps us in determining patients who often have chest pain, correct, like patients who have chest pain down their left arm into their fingers right here. If you notice, it goes right across the thoracic part of the chest, goes right down into the middle finger that you have, just kind of giving you guys some ideas. And you're looking right here where that one's at. You can actually see where the actual... T7 is, you have your, T, your T3, T4, T5, that's for cardiac patients. Here's what's interesting right here. When you're looking at this patient here, let's go to our C5 and C6, C4, C5 injuries that we can see right here. You have clavicles right here for your C4, C5 injury. Your nipples are often T4, so if you want it for the T4 injury, the patient has no feeling from the nipples down, correct? Your umbilicus is around T10 area, correct? Which says they have no feeling from the waist down. Correct? The pelvic rim from the T12, which means they may only not be able to feel anything that's in their legs. You see what I'm saying? So you have to kind of have that idea where it is. So let's cover our patient right here. Did we not say that our patient originally we thought we had a C5, C6? So let's take right here and take a look at where our C5 is and where the C6 is. Okay? Do we see anything that may preclude the factors of what we're looking at right now from that spinal cord injury? of why he may not be able to feel anything in his legs at all. Can you see that? Do you see where it is? Where the injury access may be? So when you, when you preclude off the actual, and you actually have an actual, maybe like a hematoma, or you may actually have a specific spinal cord injury, but not to the vertebral column, you can actually see that this is going to be influx and outflux of the entire spinal column that comes down and disseminates off to where? To the arms? right? Through your C6, your C7, correct? Going all the way down to C8 and all the way down the center of the vertebral column, why he cannot feel something in both his arms and his legs. But it's still, when you think about it, does it still explain the factors of what is going on with the patient of why they appear to have be hypotensive, why they have a skin is pink and dry, and a slow pulse? Because if they're truly in a shock state of condition, correct, which is what they appear to be related on blood pressure, and it appears that we may have this type of an injury of the C5 and C6, 
is there something else that's going on as well? Or is that a secondary injury related to a primary injury source itself, which may be causing something else to occur? Because normally C5, C6 injuries do not cause priapisms to occur. Other things have to be going on. So let's take a little further investigation on this one here. Okay, so again, this is your dermatome chart, looking at what you have there, okay, specifically, and what is showing related to different types of injuries, and why people have them, and what's related to their nerves, and when they start having tingling sensations, and you start to have that, you can actually use this chart to make a reflection of, okay, what's going on with the patient? Okay, you got numbness and tingling down both of his hands and his arms. He may have somewhere around the C4, or C5, C6 area that may be giving him some trouble. Okay, so now then, in looking at where our patient is right here, we're looking at, okay, I want you guys to kind of go over to page 302 for me, if you would, okay? On 302, these are signs and symptoms of spinal cord injuries, right? We know we have pain in the neck or back, pain on movement of the neck or back, correct? It says pain on palpation of the neck or back, posterior to the spine, the midline, the back, deformity of the spinal column as well. What I want to do, though, for a couple of minutes, if you, with you guys having your books that are right there, I want you guys to look at this right here on page 302. It specifically talks about, under spinal cord injuries, it says we, have, we can have cord concussion. I'm just doing a brief overview now, okay? For those of y'all, y'all should all have your books. Again, page 302 in your PHTLS book. You have cord concussions, right? You have what is known as, which a cord concussion is just a temporary disruption of the spinal cord. You also have a cord contusion, which involves bruising, right, and or bleeding of the tissues that are going to be around the spinal cord. You have what is known as spinal shock. What is spinal shock? It is a neurological phenomenon that actually occurs and may actually go away with a short period of time. We have, the other one that we have is called cord compression. That's nothing more than what? A pressure on the spinal cord that is caused by swelling of the local tissues. Does that sound like maybe what's going on with him? Possibly? Potentially? Don't know yet. You also have cord laceration. This is absolutely when the cord itself, the tissue is torn and cut. That type of injury usually results in what? Irreversible neurological injury. Are we to that point yet with this patient? Not sure yet. We've got to do some further investigation. Okay. Then we have what's called a complete cord transection. Now that's, of course, when the spinal cord itself transects, right, across, and the spinal tract itself has been interrupted, and the spinal cord itself functions. It still has a function distal to all the sites that are lost, but the upper is not. So distally you're okay, but centrally it's not, right? Then you have an incomplete cord transection, which is, which again, it's not the full, it's not the full, cord transection, but it's going to be an incomplete transection. You have what may be called an anterior cord syndrome. And again, this is typically it's a result of a bony fragment, right, that's on the cord itself that may be causing a problem with the cord and may be actually may actually be impinging on the cord itself. You have what's also known as central cord syndrome. Very interesting. This usually occurs with hyperextension of the cervical spinal area. Hyperextension meaning what? Boom, think about this right here, hyperextension, hyperflexion, hyperextension. Think about that right there, we have like a coup contra coup injury, right? Hyperextension means you've been hit in the back and your neck goes, it slings back as far as it can to get a hyperextension. Then we have another one, it's called, it's called brown, it's called brown sequard syndrome. This is nothing more than a penetrating injury that involves a transection of the spinal cord, meaning what? It's an injury that's actually like a somebody stabbed somebody with a knife right in the back, hit the spinal cord, and caused permanent damage. Okay? Those are just some things that you need to look at, okay, when we're dealing specifically with spinal cord injuries. But again, all these spinal cord injuries often may have things associated with neck or back, pain with movement, non-pain. You have pain on palpation of the posterior neck or the midline of the back where the injury may occur. And again, you have deformity off of the spinal column, which means when you're, when you're assessing the neck, you say, I'm feeling for step-offs. I'm feeling for step-offs. You know, what are you feeling for? You're feeling for displacement of the C-spine. So, 
couple more things that we can look at right here is, of course, we already we got some things going on. We have guarding and splinting of the muscles itself, right? We also, and again, we talked about paralysis, paresis, numbness, right? Tingling in the legs. Well, of course, our patient has no feeling at all, right? He can't feel anything at this point in time. But we also have to think about, is this just a related spinal injury, right, such as a vertebral injury, or do we actually have a patient who may be experiencing signs and symptoms of neurogenic shock? So, you ask yourself, hmm, I'm not sure, what is neuro do you remember what neurogenic shock is? Think about this right here, priapism in male patients. Do you remember what neurogenic shock is? We're going to talk about that here in just a little bit, okay, specifically. But I want you just to kind of start thinking a little bit about what each one of these are, so that way when we come to it, you're going to actually be able to have the knowledge of what we're talking about with neurogenic shock. Okay? You've got to think about it. So start putting it in your brain. If you already know it, that's fine. If you don't, we're going to talk about it momentarily. Okay, so now then, let's talk a little about, about spinal motion restriction. If you can, please for me, turn over to your books and page 306, okay? 306. All right? We've got a few things we're looking at right here. It says, when you think about spinal motion restriction, is based on what? The mechanism of injury. Does the patient complain of any neck pain, any back pain? Do they, are they able to move their neck? There's a lot of protocols that are out there now that, that, are, that allow medics that are in the field and they properly assess the patients. It allows them to be able to not do spinal motion restriction with some of their patients based on the fact that they have no neck pain, no back pain, no numbness, no tingling, correct? They're not putting them on a backboard causing them further injury. And again, that's going to be based on local protocol. We're not going to tell you one way or the other what to do with this, with this, course, with this course, but however, you need to follow your local protocol specifically when it comes to, to spinal motion restriction protocols in whatever your medical director chooses to have for you or your facilities or whatever else you may be using for your actual medical direction. So again, right here, looking at right here, our primary focus, of course, is recognizing what? The indications for spinal motion restriction. Do we have that indication now? Yes, we do. Look at the mechanism of injury and what's going on with it. Do we have mechanism of injury? Yes, we do. We have to think about what's going on with this patient with this injury. Okay? We also want to think about you do your complete physical assessment, which you've already talked about, correct? Your full assessment on your patient, making sure you're making good clinical judgment of what's going on with them, also looking for any further secondary injuries. And along with that, when it's a, when it's a significant type of injury like this where the head was hit, you got to always think about TBI in the back of your mind, making sure you're keeping up with that as well. So let's look right here in your books, okay, on page 306. You have several things that can talk to you about specifically about spinal motion restriction. So go along with your books. I want you guys to go to box 9-2, please, 9-2, okay? You're going to be looking at this right here, your midline spinal pain and or tenderness. This includes what? Subjective pain or pain with movement? Do I have an altered level of consciousness? And again, we talked about the TBI. Do I have paralysis or focal neurologic signs that may be causing problems to occur, such as what? Do we have bilateral numbness and bilateral paralysis? Absolutely we do. Okay? And also, do we have anatomic deformity of the spine? Like it was over here specifically, we talked about the patient with the anterior spinal column restriction where it actually was a part of the spinal column that was impinging on the actual spinal cord itself. And then, of course, does my patient have the inability to communicate? Very important. So when we're looking at this right here, we think signs and symptoms of spinal trauma. Okay? We've already covered it. We already know what it is. But again, we already had it up here on the PowerPoint. But again, let's look at it. Do I have pain in the neck or back? Does the patient have pain with movement in the neck or back? Do I have anything going on in the posterior neck or back that may cause us a problem? Such as do I feel anything out of place? Do I feel any type of a step off anywhere all the way down the back of the spine? And again, guarding or splinting. What other type of things may we, may, may we see? Again, neurogenic shock. Priapism is always the biggest thing. You know, have you ever seen it before in a patient with a spinal cord injury? May or may not. I have seen it before. And again, we have to think about, was there anything that was, that was secondarily causing this problem, such as what may have caused it, what may have potentially having a situation to occur, such as what's their glossocalcoma score? You know, their spinal tenderness. You know, is there any other distracting injury that, that may not allow me to be able to focus on this injury, such as do they have an open fracture of the femur with an arterial bleed, correct? 
those are some things that we need to think about. Do they have an evisceration that comes because they fell over something and they hit their head and now they have a spinal injury and they have a huge evisceration and, and they also may be bleeding out of the abdomen? Start looking for these things. So you can look over later on if you want to on page 307 the indications for spinal mobilization, but it's pretty much what we have covered here so far on what we've actually been talking about related to spinal motion restriction. So again, we've already covered a lot of these things right here, guys, about the, the you know, what it is to the blunt mechanisms that may cause the injury to occur, correct what type of, what may be the incident that may have caused this incident to occur, such as this person right here, he had a massive deceleration of his body whenever he hit, when he actually hit the bottom of the pool, such as a person who's involved in an auto accident. They have massive acceleration and deceleration, correct, with coup contra coup type injuries. So those are the things you need to think about. With him right here, it relates to the height of his fall. We don't know if he dove into the short end of the pool or if he dove into the deep end of the pool. So those are the things you have to think about. Okay, so a couple more things that we're going to be looking at right here, of course, is, is the patient what? Reliable to evaluate what? His condition. Do we, is the patient alert enough? Are they alert enough to talk to us? Does this patient have an altered mental status? Does he have the ability to talk to us? Correct? In this case, our patient is what? What's our patient going with this one here? He is oriented, correct? And he is mentating pro appropriately. Is that a good sign? Yes, it is, because that helps to determine we may not have a head injury. We may only have potential isolated what? Spinal cord injury, right? Specifically what type? We're not at that point yet. Okay, so what are some things that you may actually think about? Okay, what condition could be concerning you, making you doubt a patient's reliability? Let's think about that for a minute. That may doubt their reliability, such as this right here. Again, altered mental status, right? What about if they have a distracting, painful type injury, right? Communication barriers such as what? Are they, may they speak a different language? Do we have a problem communicating with anyone on the scene? Is the only assessment that we're going to have in, in communication may actually be touch. We're actually feeling what's going on. We may actually have to do hand gestures, hand movements to say what happened, right? You may not be able to talk to anyone on the scene to be able to get any information from them because they may not even be English speaking. And that's a very difficult barrier to face. I'm sure that y'all may have faced it before in the field before in the past. And again, talking about the patient, do they suffer a TBI? Are we there at that point yet? We don't have that right now because our patient right now is still alert and, and oriented. But we have to think about several things that may else be going on, such as, does my patient appear to be calm? Are they cooperative? Or do they appear to be anxious and restless related to shock? But our patient has a slow pulse right now. It's not a fast pulse, but it's a low blood pressure and skin is warm and dry. Correct? So those are some things that we need to actually think about. And along with that also, with this patient here, do they also do they have any alcohol? Is there alcohol at the location? Right? Does he have do I smell any alcohol in the patient's breath? That may give it that may be also something that could be going on that we have to pay close attention to. Because is his mentation different? Related to the fact that he may be alcohol intoxicated. If he's not alert and oriented times three or times four, is it related to the alcohol intoxication? We just don't know. But again, our patient is mentated enough that we know what's going on. And such as some things maybe see, again, distracting injuries, such as I talked about before. Do we have an obvious open femur fracture? Correct. That may have an arterial bleed. Do we have the evisceration of the abdomen, as I was talking about before? So just some things that you need to think about from where you're at and from what you have going on. But remember these things right here. You may be actually be able to use on your cell phone, correct? You may be actually be able to use the Google Translate on the phone to communicate with someone that can't talk to you, whereas in the past, for many, many years ago, if we did not have a way to talk to by someone on the scene, we didn't have a way to talk to somebody, right, if, we were, if, we, if they spoke a different language. So the wonderful advantage about modern day is we can actually use Google Translate. That does seem to help a lot and for you talking to somebody. So, let's think about this right here. How should this patient be packaged for transport? You say, oh, we put him on a backboard. No big deal, right? Well, how would you package the patient? What would be packaging different if the patient were unconscious? Would it be any different? Let's think about this right here. Y'all go over to page 309 in your books for me, okay? We've got several different methods that we're looking at right here. We know the standard, of course, the long C-spine immobilization on a regular backboard. 
We have a scoop stretcher here. Okay, let's think about this right here. Would, would we use a scoop stretcher on this patient? Would you have a reason to use a scoop stretcher? Patient has a, patient has a spinal cord injury related to a C-spine. Would the scoop stretcher be the most appropriate device to actually get this patient off the scene? Well, if they had a pelvic fracture, they were stable with no C-spine injury, potentially you could. If it was an elderly patient, you're trying to move them around and get them out of an area and, and transport them to the hospital, you could, correct? Scoop stretch is a nice device for what we use it for, and I'm sure we all know the facts of how to use that one. The vacuum mattress splint, would that be a great device? The vacuum mattress splint is what? It's going to be the device that actually wraps around them. You can actually vacuum it up around them and keep them from moving. May this be better than the backboard? You have to ask yourself that question. Potentially it could be, right? Because what it does, it's a wonderful immobilization tool, right? That is able to use instead of the scoop to be able to transport a patient because it vacuums around the body and it becomes like a rigid splint. Have y'all ever had the opportunity to use one of those before? They're very interesting. You can actually use it, you know, I've seen them before where they do a pretty good job with most patients, but however, if it's a larger patient, I found that they don't seem to work quite as well. You still need to have something solid to put them on because it's more so to try to keep the body from moving and keep them comfortable. So in turn, I often use both of the, the vacuum type mattress splint as well as on the backboard, especially if I know it's a true spinal, spinal immobilization that I'm going to have to take a, and keep an eye on for somebody. So again, you got to think about those things right there and what the transport time is going to be, how long they potentially could be on the board, what's going on with them from there. So just again, follow your local protocols related to your spinal motion restriction, you know, your clearance criteria that you're going to have for patients. Again, like we talked about, cert depends on your protocols that your medical director may have or the medical direction that you may have for your service and those type of things as far as when and when not to immobilize. But in this situation, we know that we're going to immobilize this patient. Absolutely no doubt. Okay, so now that we ask ourselves this right here, what condition could be causing the patient's vital signs to be abnormal? We're getting to it now, like we talked about before, okay? And you ask yourself this right here, what condition could be it's the patient's vital signs to be abnormal could be caused from what? We know for sure the patient experiencing some type of a what? A spinal shock, okay? And we ask ourselves, how should this patient be managed? We already know that one. Again, spinal motion restriction. We need to consider an IV because, again, remember, they are hypotensive. Even though it does not appear that it needs to be, and I'll give you this one too. The person is not on any type of a, on any type of a medication, such as a beta blocker, that would prevent their heart rate from going too fast. So that's guaranteed. So I'm going to give that one to you all. There's no beta blocker, not any beta blocker. They're just hypotensive. Skin is pink and dry, heart rate is slow. Think about it. You may already have the answer. So again, let's try this right here. We've got to maintain a blood pressure of 90. Remember, don't go over that, right? Just in case there is a head injury, right? But, it, but this right here, you have a patient that may be experiencing what is called what? What do you think it may be? What may be causing the bradycardia to occur? We talked about it a little bit, but however, do you think that it may be some sort of a parasympathetic blocking agent, correct, that may be actually increasing parasympathetic nervous system tone, right, and that you may have to give them something for, such as say they may, you need, may need to give them atropine, right, to raise, to actually maybe get their heart rate up. Do you think that may be what the cause is? Why is their pulse rate so slow? Why is their skin is, is normally dry? But yet you got to manage the bradycardia. You got and you say you have to manage the bradycardia. So when you think about it, let's go here. All right, guys. And so when you're looking at it, I want you to think about this right here on your spinal shock versus your neurogenic shock. With spinal shock, look what we have here. We have an immediate temporary loss of total power, sensation, reflexes below the level of the injury. Okay. Now below the level of the injury. All right, we do have hypotension. Notice right here with spinal shock and neurogenic shock. The blood pressure is hypotensive on both sides. Look at that. And y'all can see this, I hope. If not, you can zoom in on it. And we have bradycardia on both sides. Interesting enough. Look at motor response. With the spinal shock, we have flaccid paralysis. 
With neurogenic shock, it says it's variable. Right? That with neurogenic shock, we have variable motor response. Okay? But here we have flaccid paralysis. Is this what we have right now? Flaccid paralysis? The time frame right here, look at this. 48 to 72 hours immediately after what? The spinal cord what? Complication. Here's 40, 48 to 72 hours immediately after the same thing. Mechanism. Here's what you got. Look what we have right here. This is the mechanism, correct? We have the peripheral neurons become temporarily what? Unresponsive to the brain stem wave activity. Do you think that's what we have right now? Or, or do we have a disruption? And again, let's repeat it. Peripheral neurons, correct, become temporarily unresponsive, which means there's been a spinal shock, which means it shocked the system, correct? Just the actual injury itself, it shocked the system, and now the brain is temporarily, it's unresponsive to brainwave activity. The brain is sending out signals, but the body is not responding. You think that may be what's wrong with them? We have disruption of the autonomic nerve pathways, loss of sympathetic nervous system tone. When we lose sympathetic nervous system tone, what happens? We have an increase of what? Parasympathetic nervous system tone? Or it stays parasympathetic nervous system tone? Which means without the sympathetic nervous system, which is our flight or fight syndrome, which we often see, think about it now. With flight or fight, when the blood pressure falls, correct, the heart rate automatically increases. Respiratory rate increases. The patient becomes diaphoretic. Correct? They get cool, clammy skin, pale skin. They're trying to shut all the blood to the body to keep the core up to allow the blood pressure to remain stable. But if you have a spinal cord injury, where in the spinal cord that it causes sympathetic nervous system tone, right, that allows the sympathetic versus the parasympathetic system to actually take over, if you have a spinal cord injury there, what you're going to often get is you may get that, you'll get that warm, dry skin. You'll get that priapism that may be related to it. You'll have warm, dry skin in the area that's below the injury, and you have diaphoretic skin that's above. It just all depends on the injury itself. So we ask ourselves, what do we have? Do we have a sudden loss in this patient of sympathetic nervous system signals that's causing the hypotension, causing the slow heart rate, causing the warm, dry skin to occur? Or do we have an immediate temporary loss of total power sensation and reflexes below the level of the injury. And where's the injury at again that we have? We have an injury where? C what? Four, five, five, six, correct? We gotta think about that. So you're thinking about neurogenic shock, but just know that with each one of these, this is temporary, this may be temporary or even permanent. This could be temporary, okay? This can revert back. Temporarily, the keyword is temporary. The key word here is disruption. This may be permanent, causing permanent paralysis. This is a temporary problem. So what do we have going on? When you notice where the pain is, there's no pain anywhere else, correct? There's only pain up in the cervical spine area. So here's what we have now. Let's get back to our patient right here, okay? We're looking at this right here. The patient has patent airway. SpO2 is between 95 to 99. We titrate the IV fluids. Blood pressure is about 90. We have spinal motion restriction to prevent further injury, correct? Which is what we've already done. Patient remains normal thermic. So we definitely not look at any type of a head injury related. There's going to be any significance. We're going to transport to the closest facility. So now then, let's take a look at our vital signs under reassessment. Notice what we have here. We started in what? On fluids. So we got the pressure up to 92 over 54, correct? We're at 92 over 54 at this time, all right?